Wondering, have you seen the row that's been brewing around the so-called tourist tax? My question to you is, should visitors from overseas basically get their shopping 20% cheaper than everybody else? Your thoughts on that? And have you seen the nice adverts uh, trying to lure our medical staff over from the UK to Australia? Sounds quite good, actually. I was considering it myself. But what do you make to that? Do you think that if people are training in this country to help the health of this country that actually they should head off to the sunshine is that ethical of australia to be trying to take our staff and ceos do you think they're paid enough apparently uh, one of the heads of the FTSE 100 says we're not paying them enough to attract the very top talent to those companies and i want to end by asking you a simple question are you proud to be British. I've got it all coming up, but before we get into it all, let's bring ourselves up to speed with tonight's latest headlines. Good evening. The top story on GB News tonight. Members of a far-right militia group have been convicted of plotting the attack on the U.S. Capitol building. Donald Trump supporters stormed the building in January 2021, trying to block Congress from formalising Joe Biden as president after winning the election. Four members of the Proud Boys group, including former group leader Enrico Torrio, were found guilty of seditious conspiracy. Five people, including a police officer, died during or shortly after the riot, and more than 140 police officers were injured. Meanwhile, Donald Trump has cut short his visit to Ireland, saying he's going back to New York to confront his accuser in a civil rape case. The former US president took off on a flight from Shannon Airport just over half an hour ago. He'd been visiting his golf courses in the country. He's described the case as a political attack and says he'll probably attend the hearing. He's been accused of raping a former magazine columnist in 1996, which he denies. Now, a man arrested following an incident at Buckingham Palace has been detained under the Mental Health Act. The 59-year-old threw suspected shotgun cartridges into the grounds of Buckingham Palace on Tuesday. A controlled explosion was also carried out on his rucksack after he warned police to handle the bag carefully. He's been taken to hospital, where he'll remain on bail while receiving medical attention. The Prince and Princess of Wales have been visiting the Dog and Duck pub in central London today, ahead of the coronation. Large crowds turned up in Soho to catch a glimpse of the royal couple. They've been in the area to hear how the hospitality industry is preparing for the big event. And to get there, the pair travelled on the tube, taking the Elizabeth Line for the very first time. They chatted away to Transport for London workers about their plans for the busy bank holiday. But... A flypast to celebrate the coronation could be cancelled due to bad weather. The Ministry of Defence has warned it could hamper the ability of pilots to fly safely. Forecasters expect London to be cloudy and wet on Saturday, with rainfall forecast around lunchtime. More than 60 aircraft from the Royal Navy, the British Army, the Royal Air Force, including the Red Arrows, are scheduled to fly over the Mall and Buckingham Palace at 2.15. Now, some sad news. A local election vote has been suspended following the death of a candidate. Conservative councillor Graham Galton was running for the Coxford Ward in Southampton. He died today after serving four years as a councillor. All the polling stations in the Coxford Ward are now closed. Another election is planned within 35 days. But elsewhere across the country, voting continues with polls closing at 11 o'clock tonight. Around 8,000 seats across 230 local authorities in England are up for grabs. The results will be announced tomorrow. Full coverage for you right here, GB News. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky says Vladimir Putin must be brought to justice for the war in his country. He made the comments during a meeting at The Hague, where the International Criminal Court is based. It comes after Ukraine said it shot down 18 out of 24 drones in an overnight attack. 
The bombardment followed a strike on the Kremlin, with Moscow having accused Kyiv of trying to assassinate President Putin. Of course, we all want to see different Vladimir here <laughs> in The Hague. The one who deserves to be sentenced for these criminal actions right here in the capital of the international law. And I'm sure we will see that happen when we win. And we will win. Volodymyr Zelensky speaking there. Now, travellers from Heathrow Airport are facing disruption today, as well as long delays as security guards take further industrial action. That's after last-minute talks over a pay dispute failed yesterday. 1,400 Unite Union members have started a three-day walkout as part of an eight-day programme of strikes throughout the month of May. And lastly, animal experts are hoping they can remove the carcass of a 55-foot whale from a beach in Yorkshire. The 30-tonne mammal was spotted getting into difficulties in the sea at Bridlington. Early this week, it died on Tuesday. A huge operation now taking place. And over the next couple of days, it will include road closures in the local area, but it's hoped the body can be removed from the beach whole without the need to tamper with it. That's the latest from GB News. More news as it happens. Back now to Dubes & Co. Thanks for that, Polly. Well, I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm keeping you company right through till 7 o'clock tonight alongside me. Daniel Moylan is a Conservative peer in the House of Lords, and Aaron Bastani is the founder of Navara Media. Welcome, gentlemen, to this beautiful location again. The sun is shining. Very happy that it's uh, stood. It's stood that whole week now. There's been sun, no rain, so fingers crossed it continues as well for tomorrow. Uh, you can get in touch with me tonight in all the usual ways. GBviews at gbnews.uk is my email address. Or you can tweet me at gbnews or at of Buckingham Palace, one of the most recognisable tourist spots in the UK. Uh, it did indeed get me starting uh, to think about tourism. Lots of cheering, by the way, going on. Uh, I wonder if that's just because they've realised Jubes and Kerr has gone live and they're so happy. Uh, anyway, it's the tourists that you can hear and uh, there's something called the so-called tourist tax isn't there uh, which basically means uh, well height of excitement there coming from behind us uh, yes it basically means that uh, people visitors to the UK from non-EU countries could recover VAT on their purchases here uh, now, you might be familiar with the fact that the government scraps that measure. Apparently, it reckons that that was um, going to save us £2 billion a year. Daniel Moylan, I shall start with you. Uh, this whole VAT uh, free shopping, do you think that that should be available to shoppers, overseas shoppers or not? Yeah, two points to make about it. First of all, I think it should because the people used to come and uh, buy that stuff duty free from abroad although they got a subsidy in terms of tax it's because they were exporting it from this country and that's how VAT is meant to work and they when they come they spend a fortune usually in hotels restaurants going to the theatre things like that it's great support for the economy second point I'd make rather abstruse is I've got to mention the people of Northern Ireland the people of Northern Ireland no longer get duty-free shopping when they're travelling into the European Union, but they don't get it when they're travelling out of the European Union either. They're caught both ways because of this Windsor framework, Northern Ireland protocol, under which they have to live under EU laws. So they need sorting out as well because it's not fair on them. Aaron? On Northern Ireland, it's a great point from Lord Moylan. I completely disagree, however, with the rest of it. This costs approximately £2 billion, and I think for people watching out there, they would be taxed fundamentally to subsidise the Tom Ford shoes and the Gucci handbags of Chinese and American tourists coming here to London. They have to pay VAT on those goods. If you buy a suit in Savile Row as a British national, you have to pay VAT. Why should somebody from Shenzhen or Paris or New York not have to pay VAT? We need to stimulate the economy, absolutely no doubt about that, particularly in London, 
But if we're talking about a multi-billion pound subsidy, let's start with Britain, like British Nationals first, I think. Yeah, you see, firstly, this £2 billion pounds value that's been put on, so it doesn't really wash with me, because I think uh, the way they're calculating that is by, right, if we get this 20% of all these purchases, that's the, the sum you'll come up with. But to me, it's not factoring in um, the whole point that actually some of these people will now just choose not to purchase those goods. And you say, you know, if you're sitting at home and you work, want to kind of subsidise someone else's Tom Ford shoes, whatever, that's fair enough. That's what it is, though. Yeah, but people at home might work in some of those shops instead. And actually, you might need those shoppers to keep their shop jobs. And um, I went to Windsor at the weekend, very much a tourist place, if you're not familiar with it. And I was blown away by how many empty shops there were. It was unbelievable, yeah. Yeah. especially in this kind of run-up to the coronation. I would have thought yeah. they'd at least put pop-ups in there or something, but they were empty. Yeah. So what about the people whose jobs depend on that trade? Yeah. It's a really great point. Again, and, and I think everybody watching this, they know the high street in this country is in really big trouble. It has been for a very long time, but particularly since COVID, it's getting worse and worse. I think that's an argument for a cut to VAT, frankly. And I think people watching this who are small business owners would say, thank God, particularly in hospitality, we've had such poor weather so far this year, they would love a cut to VAT. That's the kind of policy I would want to implement when we're cut talking about... what? I think you could probably reduce it by, say, I think, let's say six... Six, seven percent for the rest of this year. About seventeen and a half, didn't it? Not that long ago, yeah. it feels like. Um, yeah, it used to be fifteen. Yeah, and quasi quiet time <laughs> actually. People might be familiar when he did um, uh, the budget that wasn't really a budget or whatever we call it these days. He actually reversed that measure, didn't he? So he, he had made he that. Did. He did, and he did it because it doesn't cost two billion at all. Because the amount of money these people spend, not to, not on the Tom Ford shoes, but on the stuff where they are paying VAT, on the restaurants and the hotels, because they can't claim that back. On the, uh, uh, and, and so on. It's, and all you're saying to them is, go and do this in Paris. Go and spend all your money in Paris or some other uh, great... No, what I'm saying city. is, I don't... That's I don't. all that's happening as a result. What I'm saying is, I don't understand why... I don't understand why a British taxpayer should subsidise the well, holidays of people from overseas. Well, of course it's it is. It's subsidy. They Lord are spending huge amounts of money here and if it costs nothing, it's not a subsidy. Well, it doesn't cost and nothing. I don't I would, think I, it costs anything at all because the, well, amount, of money, isn't it? the amount of money you'd collect on the hotels, on the restaurants, on the theatres, and all of those things would way exceed the two I, I, I just think it's utterly daft that the British taxpayer would pay for an Italian or a French person or a Chinese person going to Savile Row and getting 20% off a suit, where if that same taxpayer themselves buys the same suit, they have to pay the VAT. I think that's in instinctively, I just find that utterly ridiculous, frankly. But you're not taking from the taxpayer, are you? You're not going to take that 20% off the taxpayer and take it and give it to well, the it is. It's two, it's, it's two. It's two billion pounds, or let's say it's one billion pound. It's a significant sum of money that the I mean, exchequer has to find from elsewhere. This is the trouble we have with our exchequer nowadays is that all they think about is, when they look at taxes, all they think about is the effect on tax revenues for them, if you like, from their narrow vision. They never think about the effect on the economy. And their models don't even include the effect on the economy. That's one of the reasons we have such high taxes and no growth, because they're in the wrong mindset altogether. The economy can get benefits from exactly this sort of measure. People get jobs and the revenue can actually end up getting higher income, but their models don't take account of that. That's where the two billion comes I, from, I, dodgy models. I agree with you. So let's do that, starting with British nationals. Let's cut VAT for people in this country to be able to buy cheaper goods and services. Why give it to tourists? It's crazy. So if you're in that mindset then, uh, extrapolating this out, are you um, in the mindset of Labour Party, they get uh, elected they're going to put VAT onto things like private school fees. Mm. Would you be against that? I think fundamentally that private schools are they're private enterprises, and I think instinctively, again, they should probably have to pay VAT. But what I would say they're is... They're not private enterprises. Oh, hold on. Most the, of them are charities. The, 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 well, this is what, that, that's what's being contested fundamentally. But what I would say is, my, and this is a real worry, actually, I think I don't know if Labour have really costed it. I do support them having to pay VAT. However, you've got 7% of kids going to private schools. Clearly, a 20% increase in fees is going to make a massive difference to many people. They're going to withdraw those kids from schools. I think it will probably raise less money than Labour is saying. And you have the <coughs> issue then of those kids going into the state system and costing more money. So you could end up in a situation where it's revenue negative. So I, I, I think that's a very different situation. With this, I'm saying... No, I was just pushing you because you were saying let's slash VAT yeah. and all the rest of it. No, it's a really interesting it. debate. So instinctively, I think they should, but I think it could go very badly wrong. So I'm very open to the opposite side of the debate with regards to that. But on this, if we're giving a multi-billion pound stimulus to the high street, which I think we should, let's start with consumers living and working in the UK rather than tourists. 
And do you think, um, when you have this conversation, and actually, because um, there's a big campaign in one of the newspapers now, a lot of business owners, a lot of the kind of airport bosses, they're all getting in touch and supporting this campaign. Yeah. Uh, do you think that actually this is a nod to the fact that actually Kwasi Kwarteng, with his uh, budget or whatever, what did he call it? Like a statement, it wasn't a budget or whatever. A fiscal event, fiscal I think. Fiscal event, there you go. It was definitely that. The new word. But do you think that uh, this is like another nudge to perhaps say that he was right in this thinking? Well, this campaign started before Kwasi Kwarteng, and in a way he was responding to it. It started, I was, I was arguing this um, well before Kwasi became um, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer. So the campaign started, but it's really getting traction now because the economy is flatlining. And people are feeling that, and it's flatlining because the government's chosen a high tax policy. That's simple as that. And do you support that high tax policy? He's saying that we've got one. Do you think that's no. the right, or would you have it even higher still? No, I think the, 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 the single best thing we can do right now, and I'm shocked that the government hasn't done it in the last 18 months, is to cut VAT. Good for small businesses, good for the consumer. Um, also, as well, I can't help but think about business rates. When I'm thinking about VAT and I'm thinking about enticing shoppers and I'm thinking about the amount of closed shops. Honestly, I was shocked when I saw Windsor. Because, uh, you know, it is the Queen, she thinks everything smells of fresh paint, everyone does everything right before that. Literally, I was there at the weekend and I could not believe mm. the state mm. of one of their primary high streets. So many empty shops. Yeah. They're bunting from like, it looked like it was about two years old. It was all faded. It was an absolute mess. And I thought, why aren't you trying to stimulate that? Doing pop ups, as I said, cutting these business rates. But no one seems to be able to tackle the whole business rate thing properly, anyway. Business rates is really interesting because I, I live in Portsmouth and I often go into businesses which are doing really well. I probably shouldn't say this. And they're doing super well. And I said, Do you pay business rates? They go, No, we don't have to pay business rates. And I'm thinking, Well, you're making so much cash. Why don't they have to pay business I, rates? Because the thresholds in different councils are at different levels and, it, and you know square footage and all this business. And I think it's a very antiquated, strange system. And at the same time, department stores have gone out of business, partly because in somewhere like Torquay or Bournemouth or Portsmouth, where they have just disappeared, because of the giant square footage for those department stores, they never stood a chance. So I think business rates is something we absolutely need to, need to revisit because it's just not working. Roger, well, your viewers have, have heard my views on business rates before. All that will happen if you cut business rates is the benefit will go to the landlord. It will end up yeah, producing right. higher rents for the landlord. The business might benefit in the, in the short term while they've still got a fixed rent on a lease, but when the lease comes for renewal, they negotiate the rent they'll be willing to pay up uh, and the landlord will get the benefit. And it will be the biggest transfer of wealth to, to property owners so how would you do since it then, the instead? Enclosures Act. I wouldn't touch business rates. I, 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 ideally, the business rate should be a charge on the land, on the shop owner rather than on the business. But changing that would be a very complicated thing to do. Um, but, but that really is what it is. It's a, it's a charge on the ownership of property. And you take it away and you, the beneficiaries will be the owners of the property over time. Uh, Roger, he's a man on the same wavelength as me, because literally just as I started the conversation about business rates, Roger was uh, getting in touch saying uh, he feels as well where he lives, the main reason that town shops are struggling is uh, the business rates. He's blaming it all on the councils, uh, saying that they're targeting cars as well, uh, as though they are cash cows. Uh, I tell you, you won't get any pushback <laughs> on uh, me from the whole situation about uh, cars. They do. I think some councils seem to see cars as a bit of an ATM. All these cameras everywhere, all these new rules. Um, Paul says, once again, a socialist cannot see the woods for the trees. If VAT-free shopping encourages more sales to overseas visitors, then surely it will generate a valuable revenue trail for hard-pressed retailers. Uh, someone else is just getting in touch, saying that I completely agree with Aaron. It's the UK uh, consumers that should have a VAT cut, if anyone at all. Uh, one of my viewers, I've just lost your name because they come in so quick. Uh, you just said you were really surprised to hear me say yesterday that I didn't feel that lots of the country was celebrating the coronation. Uh, that's not what it was. What it was is one of my viewers, uh, Mike, I think it was called, he might be watching now on Twitter, he said that he didn't feel like the Northerners, for example, were celebrating the coronation. So I was asking you whether or not you are. And actually, it inspired me, that uh, tweet from Mike, because what I'm going to do tomorrow is show some of your pictures. So if you are setting yourself up for a good old coronation knees up at the weekend, get some pictures over to me of your setup. Is it all going on in your street, your living room, wherever? I don't mind. Get me your pictures and I'll be sharing those on the show tomorrow. Uh, in just a couple of minutes, though, I want to ask you, do you think it's ethical to try and learn medical staff from abroad? And vice versa, by the way, because Australia, they're desperate for our staff now, so it seems. See you in two.
it's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic, we do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. So Jubes and Co, we tackle the issues of the day with real robust debate. Both sides of the fence, battling it out with me in the middle with my forthright opinions and views. And often really interesting things happen because you start with a position and then by the end of the debate, you find actually, well, I might not have thought about that one. What we need in this country is two new political parties. You should maybe think about doing a 2024 calendar. <coughs> I'm Michelle Jubry and I'm keeping you company right through until seven o'clock this evening. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's watching. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11pm. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yes, yeah, right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers. Tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. I'll spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway. Headliners every night from 11 on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Saturday nights on GB News. From 6pm, I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Saturday nights on GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jibs & Co with me, Michelle Drewbury, right through till 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, Daniel Moylan is a Conservative peer in the House of Lords, and Aaron Bastani is the founder of Navara Media. Yeah. Lots of conversation going online. Adam Brooks, he's actually one of our, I like him, he um, does Dan Wotton show, actually. He's saying um, he celebrates, well, celebrate, it might be an exaggeration, I might have added that bit in, hmm. but he actually basically agrees with pretty much everything that you're saying on VAT. Um, he's saying it quitting VAT would encourage spending, cheaper goods for the consumer, it wouldn't cost the taxpayer, will increase revenue to the Treasury and save many jobs and businesses. Um, one of my viewers as well got in touch saying I live near Bister Village and he says that all the shoppers there, they do get their VAT back. I think what you're referring to is if you get your goods shipped directly overseas, so if you go to your Bisters or wherever, um, then you can get your goods dispatched and get that discount, but you can't do it the way you used to, which is go to your shop, get a jacket, stick it on and get your 20% back. Those days are gone, I'm afraid. Anyway, right, let's talk medical stuff, shall we? Are you a doctor, a nurse or anything similar? Would you quite fancy? A life in the sun because an advert has been published in the British Medical Journal basically offering junior doctors in the UK you ready nearly 130 grand annual salary apparently plus other perks if they move to Australia now this is dividing opinion um, I think I'll start with you on this one actually Aaron yeah some people are saying it's outrageous uh, that Australia are doing this you'll remember they had that kind of uh, the group that came over the delegate came over I don't know a couple of weeks ago to do like a whole business uh, recruitment event on this. Mm. Other people are saying, well, all's fair in uh, love and recruitment because we do that to other countries. What says you? Well, that's certainly true because we get nurses from some of the poorest countries in the world 
And the World Health Organization has repeatedly told us off for doing that, mm. rather than train our nurses here at home, which is what we should be doing, rather than lumbering them with about a £56,000 debt on average. Um, this is really remarkable because not only is it £130,000 a year salary, £1,000 a shift, it's 20 days off a month, mm. plus a two-bed apartment. You're almost selling it to yourself, no, aren't you? Yeah. I, I, I see like that you're I'm con the, uh, contemplating yeah, it. Yeah, I'm in the wrong game. You know, I, I, I re regret not training as a doctor. Joking aside, obviously, if I hadn't, I wouldn't be going to Australia. But it is a really, really uh, remarkable snapshot, I think, of the fact that, particularly the right, conservatives, they love to talk about the fact we live in a global economy, Labour's mobile, it can go here or there. If our rates of tax are too high, we won't attract investment, entrepreneurs, etc., etc. I'm sure... Lord Moylan believes that. I'm sure you believe that. I, I believe it to an extent. But they don't seem to think the same rules apply with regards to medical staff. So we are training up doctors and nurses, and the exact same rules apply to them. If we lumber them with debt, if housing's too expensive, if quality of life is too low, and then they get an offer like this, 130 grand a year with 20 days off a month, they're going to go. And I think that's a really big consideration in terms of staff retention for the NHS going forward. Daniel? I don't know why you think I disagree with that. I think it's perfectly OK if somebody, a, a doctor, wants to take that job. That's fine. There'll be a limited number of jobs there, and those who do take them are perfectly entitled to. We don't have sort of modern slavery. Uh, do you not think it's a problem for the UK, though? Uh, no, people aren't. Uh, no, people are going to take jobs elsewhere. And there, there is a shortage of doctors and nurses and other staff. Um, we, we bring people in from elsewhere. Um, the fact that the WHO criticises it, I think, is probably a positive because they, everything they say is wrong um, <laughs> and mostly dictated by China. Um, the, the fact is that's one of the best things we can do for those countries, actually, because they get... For trained. Australia? No, no okay. when, we bring, in, when we bring in people from overseas, they actually come here, they get the chance, they train as doctors and nurses precisely in the, with the intention of coming here. They know there are jobs for them here. It allows them to um, get a better life here and send money home to support their families in their own countries. And I think it's absolutely fantastic that we take people from other countries. At the same time, I do agree with you, we should be training more people uh, in this country. But we have a shortage of labour in this country. We would have recognised that we've got the blessings of full employment. You know, when I was young, uh, we have mass unemployment. Now we've got full employment in this country and we moan about it all the time. Have we, have we really got full employment or is that just a label that people say to it's make a, the government it's, sound it's good? A, it's an economic term. It doesn't mean absolutely everybody's working. It means anyone who wants a job can get one. That's what it means. It obviously doesn't mean you've got children working and you haven't got retired people working. But you've got people, people who want a job can get a job, basically. And the numbers who are unemployed um, through um, uh, through tr through um, lack of choice is a very very small compared to well, what it is. Well, there's a lot of jobs. Um, so just <clears> in there NHS are England, just to give you some context, just in NHS England, there's about 130,000 jobs vacancies uh, that need filling. About 165,000 vacancies in social care, etc. Um, I, I, I'm sure I'm right on this. I think that there's a list, and it's kind of like you'll have a red list, etc. Which countries um, where where the this country is really kind of advised you don't take staff from there because yeah. their healthcare is in really dire straits, whatever. So there are obviously some kind of standards and all the rest of it. I would actually, if it was me running this country, which luckily for everyone it's not, I would One say, day. right, yeah, no thanks, those days are gone. <laughs> um, but I would say, actually, if you're training to be a doctor or a nurse or whatever it is, I would set up something which is almost writes off your, your fees your debts and all the rest of it, if you commit and stick within the NHS for, I don't know what, just say 10 years, so mm. then we're right off your debt. Mm. I think it's sensible. Yeah. I, think we, I think we need to have those kinds of conversations because what, I think where we probably disagree here, Lord Moylan, is, and it's a problem that Britain's not had for a very long time, which is um, brain drain. We've not had it for mm. a very long time. And if we see in this country wages continue to stagnate, it's hard to get on the housing ladder. Young engineers, health workers, computer scientists, accountants, many of them are going to leave, and they're going to leave after the taxpayer is invested in their primary, secondary, and to some extent tertiary education with healthcare workers, even though they pay fees as well. And I think that's a major, major problem for us over the next 10, 20 years. Well, we've years. had brain drain, haven't we, from north to the south. A lot of people yeah. leave the north and all the rest of it to go to London. Um, in terms of healthcare salaries in this country, do you think they're high enough? You've got the situation uh, where the BMA, uh, the RCN, they're still pushing back for higher pay rises. Do you think they should be paid more? Well, I think it depends. I think it varies from group to group. Um, so I'm, I'm much less sympathetic, for example, to the junior doctors, because the doctor, even if they stay in this country, apart from the opportunities overseas, 
even if they stay in this country, junior doctors become senior doctors, and we call them consultants, and they tend to get very well paid towards the end of their career. So it's sort of balance. So you don't get paid so well at the start, but you get really well paid later on. And it's, it's it, it, you know, that, that needs to be taken into account as well. Whereas with nurses, it, it's, it's harder with nurses to justify that because the career progression isn't there for, for so many of them in those numbers. But I think the government also has a major problem, which is the NHS is, is eating up a huge amount um, of, um, of taxpayer money and will continue eating up more and more. And, and if, you want, if all that money goes into wages and salaries, then none of it, it's not going into improvements in care, better equipment, better hospitals, things like that, which are also really important. So it's difficult for the government um, to, to get this right. And what do you think to these <coughs> union demands? So I think it's the VMA is about 35% pay rise, etc. Where do you stand on that? I think it's completely sensible to give them everything they want. Because well, this 35% is, yeah, pay rise? Uh, yeah, because it's going to cost the taxpayer about a billion pounds. And one in three junior doctors are looking to leave the country. I mean, understandably so, when you see, this, see a story like that. So we have an issue. Now, imagine you're a business. You, have, you employ 50,000 people, and you have 10,000 employees right at the bottom of the ladder. They're just starting out in that career. You're a major multinational. And you know one in three of your employees are looking to leave. A private enterprise would do everything they could to keep them. And I find it absolutely remarkable that the, that the government isn't thinking in the same terms, which is, OK, a billion pounds, let's at least mitigate this problem for the next two, three years. How do we keep staff retention? So what retention? is that, a billion pounds what? So you're it's, saying it's a that billion pounds to give junior doctors the pay rise that they're the 35%. asking for. 35 percent? Yeah, because there's not so, that many of so them. So you're going to give uh, an extra 35 percent to these doctors this year? Yes. And then come next year, the nurses are going to go, hang on, just a nanosecond. Yeah. I only got 5% plus a small bonus. Yeah. He got 35% last yeah. year. I'm going to go again. This time I want 25%. Yeah. And then so on and so forth. So you're saying I would give everyone whatever it is that they not want. Not everyone. Not everyone. Who then? I, no, no, not everyone. I think the NHS healthcare is a very, very strategic industry. Without an, a functioning NHS, the country has big problems very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a very different situation. So that 35% figure, where does it come from? It's because in terms of their pay today compared to 2010, if they'd had pay rises in line with inflation, it would be around 35% higher. Yeah. So I think it's sensible to basically reverse the pay cuts that they've had over the last 13 years. That's what that demand basically I, I consists of. I know exactly of. what that demand comes from. And it's also the fact that a lot of these people, they joined that profession knowing their pay. It's a lot of these people that we're saying, we want to take our pay back to 2008, 2010, whenever it is. Yeah. A lot of these people that have started as junior doctors, they've started knowing the salary as it is now. They chose that profession on the basis of what their pay is. And now a lot of people will say it's a little bit rich having took your salary today or last year or the year before or whatever to now say, whoa, Tiger, my pay should be yeah. backdated to what it was, what it should have been years before I even joined the profession. You're a businesswoman. Now, I know if you had a situation where you had a big chunk of your staff doing this and they wanted fundamentally not huge sums of money. I know a billion pounds is a lot of money, but, but that tax, that VAT tax cut for tourists is approximately, let's say, ballpark a billion as well. So for the government, it's not a massive sum of money. If you were a CEO, you would think, I don't agree with them. You would maybe say the exact same thing, but you say, as a business person, this is a problem that I need to address, staff retention, one in three of them is looking to go overseas, what do I have to do? Now, you might not give them 35%, you might say 25%, but clearly you have to address that problem, and I think that's something the government isn't doing. Uh, I've got so many questions for you, uh, but Daniel, I'm <laughs> conscious that you... Uh, I want well, to bring I you back just want in. to say that you know, that money is coming straight out of the pockets of taxpayers. You didn't say um, that about the tourist tax, did you? Uh, uh, but I don't think the tourist tax is costing two billion. I think the tourist tax would actually in increase revenues to the treasury. Yeah, the treasury it's just their do yeah, but it's because they're dodgy models that they live off that we uh, they need to change. So it's dodgy for um, the issues you disagree with, and it's fine well, for the issues you agree with. Billion, I didn't know the figure of a billion. And I'm taking that from you yeah. and not disputing it. So if it's a billion, it's a billion. But the fact is that, as Michelle said, the differentials, what used to be called differentials when we had, to, had pay bargaining all those years ago, the differentials will show up very quickly indeed because the nurses very understandably will say, what's 25, what's it, 35% compared to my 5%? Next year or even this year, we'll, we'll rattle, you know, we won't even accept the 5% this year. Um, and we'll be back on strike in the hope of getting 30, 35%. And that will not be a billion when you start calling them the nurses because there aren't just a few of them. So I, I think, you know, all of that money is going to come out of the taxpayers. This is, you say a businessman <clears throat> would put the put, put I absolutely the money believe that, yes. Where would that money be coming from? Now, that would either be coming 
off his customers or it will be coming off his shareholders. Um, I don't know. Well, but it doesn't of come from nowhere. Speaking of businessmen, press pause on our thoughts for a second because in two minutes I want to get into this thing so we'll continue this conversation because CEOs of top businesses, the FTSE 100s, do you think they're paid enough? There's calls now actually that if you want to get the best talent, apparently we're not paying enough to attract them. Do you want these big bosses to pay more? See you in two. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, yeah. suffering on a scale completely uh, unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories. Right, folks, that Ooh. was a spicy one, wasn't it? With us four, plus a special guest. Sometimes she has to stick her foot in it. Sometimes she has to say things as they are. Sometimes I think we should keep the refugees and send the pensioners to Rwanda. <laughs> then we'd be in a much better state. Well, yeah. 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 The Saturday Five. Saturday night from 8. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello there, welcome back to Jubes & Co with me, Michelle Jubri, keeping you company till 7 o'clock tonight. Daniel Moylan, the Tory peer in the House of Lords, is here, as is Aaron Bastani, the founder of Navara Media. A couple of you getting in touch saying, Michelle, the dark clouds are gathering behind you. Uh, Steph on Twitter asks, what would you do if it starts raining? Uh, well, we'll just push on. We'll carry on regardless. We will we'll carry um, on. Yes, we'll um, echo Jacob Rees-Mogg the other day when he just didn't even blink when a controlled explosion went off behind him. Uh, if he didn't blink at that, then rain would not stop us. Don't worry about that. Uh, Dave, Only water. that is a, a lovely picture you've just sent me of your legs there as you watch us on your new recliner. That is, of course, in response to me saying, I want to see your setup at home. Uh, are you having a coronation party? Have you got your bunting out? What's going on in your street? I shall get uh, your best pictures onto my show tomorrow so make sure you keep them coming in but let's continue our conversation about pay because apparently companies have been turned off the UK um, because top executives are underpaid this is according to the head of the London Stock Exchange she reckons that compared to other countries the top salaries of the CEOs just basically don't cut the mustard 
Uh, Daniel, do you think we need to be paying these top CEOs more? I don't know. The, but the truth is, what she's getting that is, at... That's a very insightful answer. There. Thanks, Daniel. I like <laughs> and you. It will depend well from, worth the fee. It will depend from case to case. But what she's getting at here, actually, is not <laughs> that the companies don't pay, because companies can pay what they want. It's that in big listed companies, companies listed on the stock exchange, they have to have a pay policy. And what you're getting now is left-wing activists getting shares in the company and getting together and ganging to vote down the pay policy so that the companies can't actually have freedom to pay what they'd, what they'd like to pay. And they're doing that for purely political reasons. And she's saying that is having an effect because in some cases you can't get the people you need and they can go and get stuff abroad. Now, I think we can get British bosses who can do lots of these jobs, but remember, British bosses can go and work overseas as well. So the companies need that flexibility, and I think it's ridiculous that they've had this idea now that the shareholders decide what people are going to be, be, be paid when it should be a job for the management to do. That's my view. Aaron? <coughs> yeah, it's... Um... Aaron believes you should pay whatever they ask, because he said that about the junior doctors. So no, 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 not oh, at all. It's different now, is it? Well, it is certainly different because these people, on average, are earning 3.4 million pounds a year, which is more than a hundred times what the average person earns in this country. So it is different, yes. I mean, ultimately, I mean, I somewhat agree with what you say because ultimately, it boils down to the shareholders. If they believe that a CEO is adding sufficient value to the company, they will reward them um, appropriately. I think realistically. Some random person, or this is not random person, is the CEO of the London Stock Exchange, saying that we need to give CEOs more. I just find it bizarre. I mean, if you believe in market capitalism, surely that's up to the shareholders. But what she will be saying, because also as well, there seems to be uh, a slight decline in terms of companies listing on uh, yeah. UK stock exchanges. I'm not talking about FTSE 100, I'm talking about general. Um, and obviously, this is a global market now. Yeah. So post-Brexit and all the rest of it, we should be pioneering, saying, right, who are the best business brains across the globe? Sure. How do we entice them here? I was trying to find an exact number of how many employees are in the FTSE 100, and I couldn't find. I was finding all different accounts. I decided just to leave that figure. But these men uh, and women, largely men, let's, let's accept that, uh, they are in charge of uh, and responsible for the fortunes of probably millions of workers yeah. in this country. Yeah. And I always find this kind of ratio quite interesting. So when people take the CEO average and compare it to, I don't know, the average worker in their organization, they'll say, well, I'm comfortable with a ratio of X, but I'm not comfortable with a ratio of Y. Why does it matter to link the, the CEO's pay to the workers? Is the Royal Navy a world-class organization? Uh, I guess it depends what you're benchmarking it well, do you think Do you think the, the US Navy is a world-class organization? I've never even sat and thought about it. Because Why? the pay ratio in the US Navy is 8 to 1. So the highest paid member of the US Navy is paid 8 times more than the lowest paid. The reason they do that is to create a spirit de corps, a sense of togetherness, a sense of purpose, a sense of mission. Now, I don't expect companies on the, on the FTSE 100 to have an 8 to 1 pay ratio, but I think there is something very valuable for a private company where you say, we treat all of our workers well. There is a threshold we don't fall below. That's certainly not the case for big, big players like G4S or Serco on the London Stock Exchange. I agree with much of what you just said, and I think we should absolutely reward talent. However, when I look at CEOs in the private sector in this country, look at, for instance, the Royal Mail CEO. Mm -hmm. There was a guy called Rico back a few years ago. He got a giant golden handshake. He was on millions of pounds a year. He got a golden goodbye. And the guy was working from home, I think, by Lake Geneva in Switzerland. So the idea that we're not paying these people enough, I just find absolutely remarkable. But do you remarkable. not think people should be paying from home? Do you think uh, your achievements, etc., are based on you being in the office? No, I don't. I just don't understand how it, that Rico Back is a great example. I think your, your audience can, can Google him and find out. Or water companies. You know, the average exec now, a privately owned water company in this country, they're earning a million pounds a year. Their pay has gone up past a million for the first time ever. Their profits, uh, I think, went up, I think, significantly last year. Yet they're dumping millions of, of, of litres of... Um, sewage. rubbish and yeah. sewage, yeah, I mean, effluent into our waterways every year, and customers are paying more and more. So why are we rewarding these CEOs? So it's a mixed picture. I think we should reward outstanding senior management. Oh, I don't think we have that much of it in this country. But that's the point, though. She's saying you haven't got enough of it because the pay isn't enough to bring them here. Um, Daniel, what do you think to these kind of ratios and links between staff pay and CEOs? I think star companies should pay their staff properly and well and decently. Of course they should. Um, at every level in the organization. But I think, you know, there are, there are people with particular skills you need. Now, I, I personally think an awful lot of these chief executives 
um, don't have particular skills, and I don't think they're worth it. Um, oh, and some not. of them are pretty disastrous once they get into position. But there are certain professions I know, senior engineers and people like that, who can command their own salary. And there are projects for them, major works for them, that they can go around the world. And, and they are in demand, and British engineers in particular are in demand, and they set their own salaries. And if you want them to work in this country, given the high rates of tax and everything else, then you're going to have to pay them because they won't be here otherwise. They'll be in Hong Kong, they'll be in Dubai, they'll be in the Gulf, whatever, doing major projects there. And good luck to them. They've got the skills, they've got the qualifications. So I think the people who are really qualified, I understand why they have to pay them. Uh, let me ask you at home, throw this open to you, uh, one of the points that Aaron was just making there. You know, when you go to work, your morale, uh, how much of that, if any at all, I don't know, is linked to your boss? So do you sit there going, well, I only earn, what, I don't know, 30 odd grand uh, a year, he earns whatever, two million. And does that demoralise you? Do you compare your wage to uh, that of the boss or not? Uh, also, I've got a question for you, a very simple one. Are you proud to be British? See you in two. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Jubri, keeping you company until 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me, my panel, Daniel Moylan, is a Tory peer in the House of Lords. And Aaron Bastani is the founder of Novara Media. Welcome back, everyone. Kathy says uh, on Twitter that the guy on the panel is the best thing since sliced bread. Um, 
and she says, can we have him back? But we don't know who it is that you're referring to, Cathy. It's obviously Lord Moylan. No, yeah, Aaron. we were debating about this. So, <laughs> Cathy, get back in touch on Twitter and tell me which one of them uh, is it that you are referring to. Lots of you getting in touch about that question that I just posed you ahead of the break about are you proud to be British? One of my um, uh, viewers has just said, what a daft question, Michelle. Yes, of course I'm proud to be British. Well, uh, there's a survey being conducted that's found that apparently two-thirds of Britons feel less proud of the UK than they did five years ago. Apparently also 68% of people feel that the UK is generally in decline. Cool, blimey. That's quite a high statistic, almost 70%. Really? I mean, I, I have to make this caveat. I've never been polled for anything in all my life, so I do always wonder who are these people that get polled, but nonetheless, uh, what do you make to that? I think they're right. I think the country is in decline, and I think that's. Um, I think it goes beyond party politics. I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. You said Windsor. I think people go to their local high street, they see lots of empty shop fronts. There has been... I mean, crime generally is down, but violent crimes are up. There's a sense that the police aren't really visible anymore. I mean, the police certainly don't solve many crimes. Mm. Um, and I, I, housing is very expensive. There's a sense, particularly even if you're doing well and you're in your 50s or 60s, you recognise that people in their 20s are going to struggle to get the housing ladder, etc. Hard to start families. We know that because of falling birth rates. So I think there is a general sense that we're not quite in the place that we should be. Um, and, and you might say, well, that's just natural, you know, uh, glass half empty. I think it's more than that. But nearly all of those were essentially financial. Yeah. And do you think that's what people base their pride on their nation of, the finances of that nation? Not financial. I mean, High Streets is a great example. Um, where I live, on, on one of the roads there, there used to be a Debenhams on one side and a John Lewis on the other side. And it was just a place where people could be together. You know, you'd have older, older people, for instance, they might just go have a browse around, have a cup of coffee and see the world pass by. Those people now some don't leave their house, right? You know, or they might just go to a Costa Coffee, not talk to anybody, go back against that. That sense of community and connection has, I think, over the last 15 years, really disappeared to a significant extent. And people need that. And I think there's a recognition there that as a community, as a nation, something's not quite right. Daniel? Yeah, I think Aaron's got a point, actually. I think, you know, we're not... I don't think we're in decline, and I don't think people feel we're in decline, but we're in a period of great change. Economically, we've been at best flatlining. The economy hasn't grown. We haven't gone into recession. But, um, but we haven't grown, so it's been flatlining. Um, and I think the government could do things about that, but it's chosen you know, not to do, because it's focusing on, on, on getting the taxes and debt and borrowing uh, right from its point of view. Um, and they could do things about that. So I think the real question is, you know, where are we going from here? But the other question is, does that affect your sense of pride in your own country? Mm. And I'm not sure that, you know, although this article you've given us starts by telling us two-thirds um, are less proud. It doesn't, the, the article, that's the headline, the article doesn't say that. It doesn't say they're less proud of being British. I think people are still proud of being British, still proud of being British um, on the whole, and it's um, pretty, pretty positive. But we are in a period of change. It's a very difficult period. A lot of it's caused by inflation. The Bank of England let inflation get totally out of control. Nobody's holding them to account for that. Um, and they're still not bringing it down. And until that's sorted, nothing is going to come right. Because yeah. when prices are going up the whole time, people are, and their wages aren't, people are rightly miserable about it. Yeah, I've got to say, I feel um, that we're such a divided nation. And I don't remember, maybe it started with Brexit, maybe it was uh, long gone, long before then. But to me, it, there's such a divide in society. I almost feel like there's a lot less tolerance as well in society. I, I don't judge necessarily the financial things, mm. albeit I would, and people, my viewers will roll their eyes, because I would pin a lot of this on the response to the COVID pandemic, where they isolated people in their homes, they, they shut down people's well-being interactions, connections, they decimated high streets, economies and all the rest. So that's where I would place the economic decline at, at that door. Um, you guys are getting in touch. Alan says, I used to be proud. I'm a veteran commander, said for 31 years. We were respected everywhere. She, he now says, mental health problems are present in all ages. Um, we've lost the great British spirit. I think that's an interesting point. What is the great British uh, spirit? Uh, Andrew says, I'm absolutely proud to be British. Unfortunately, he says, not enough in this country are. Uh, Joanne says, in simple terms, no, I'm not proud. We've lost our way, allowing um, minority groups to erode our history and our culture and change who we are and what we stand for. She says, it's an embarrassment. 
Adrian says, yes, I'm proud to be British. Uh, Brexit made me say so. The absolute pig's ear, though, the idiots in Parliament, uh, what they've made of it, says less so. Terry says, the new guy, Aaron, is spot on tonight. He's got his finger on the pulse of the UK today. That says Terry. Um, Robert says, we are on a downward slope. Well, look, you know what? This weekend, an opportunity for everyone to get out and come together. Even if you're not like a massive royalist, um, you can get out, come together, meet your neighbours, interact with those people on your street. Please get your photographs in uh, to me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. I want to see how you're celebrating. I believe all of us need a little bit of a shot of positivity in this country. Wouldn't go amiss with it. Um, that's all I've got time for. Aaron, Daniel, very much enjoyed your company. Your yes, thank you, it Michelle. didn't rain. Maybe it might. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your company. Have a fantastic evening. Don't go anywhere. Nigel Farage is up next, but I'll see you tomorrow. Good evening. This is your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. I'm Alex Deakin. A damp start for many tomorrow, but it should get a bit brighter through the day. And then we're looking at heavy, perhaps thundery showers developing. Low pressure is anchored out to the west and it's spinning the weather fronts our way. They've already made for some quite wet conditions across parts of Wales and southwest England earlier today. And that's spiralling northwards. So outbreaks of rain pushing into northern England, northern Ireland and southern and central Scotland too. Much of East